Hey everyone, today I'm going to review a game that was on my list of my top 5 games of October. Now, it was a game that I was expecting to be good, but not necessarily a game that I was expecting to blow my mind. Now, October 8th rolled around, and I did pick up my copy of Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. However, I didn't get to play it right away. The reason why is basically as usual, I had a lot going on that week. I was already working on two other videos. And on top of it, after a day or two, I wasn't really hearing a lot about the game. So unfortunately, my expectations at that point dropped, because normally a great game, you hear a lot of noise about it and whatnot. So, it wasn't exactly pressing me to play the game right away. However, uh, four or five days after the release, things cleared up in my schedule, I was able to pop the game into my Switch, and honestly, I was really surprised because the game actually did blow me away in a sense. So let's get to the review and let's take a look at Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. On the surface, Ukulele and the Impossible Lair looks deceptively underwhelming. And on top of it, it's played by being the sequel to not a bad, but unfortunately rather in my opinion, mediocre and forgettable first game in the series. But don't be mistaken, the sequel has nothing to do gameplay-wise with the first game in the series, and actually I'd be ready to say had they not reused the same two main characters in the game, you would be tempted to think that the two games actually have very little to do one with another. The game starts with Capital B, the main baddie in the storyline, trying to seize control of the Stingdom from Queen Phoebe. And she quickly calls in the help of Yuka and his companion Lely to help combat this baddie. And she gives them the power of what she calls her Battalion, which basically gives your characters invincibility to be able to beat Capital B. However, th things go quickly awry and Capital B manages to qu capture the battalion, taking away your invincibility, and he escapes to his impossible lair. And yes, this game basically starts by the last level. And at any point in the game, you can actually attempt to finish the last level of the game. However, unless you're some kind of freak gaming genius, uh, it's pretty much impossible as the title of the game suggests. And basically, you're going to have to free members of the battalion, which act as sort of a free damage boost for the last stage for everyone you unlock. And I would say most players will have to go through the levels and unlock most, if not all, of the battalion to actually get through that last level. Honestly, I really love that concept. So, after failing at the impossible lair for the first time, that's where the real game starts. And basically, it's been broken down into pretty much two parts. You have an overworld, which is much more of a 3D puzzle platformer, much more geared towards the puzzles than the platforming or any type of action. Uh, the puzzles are not overly complex, and the world is filled with a lot of quirky and really funny characters to meet. So it's actually refreshing to see an overworld that's more of just a hub, to basically, for getting from one stage to the other. When you enter the stages, however, the game shifts dramatically. At this point, the game really becomes a 2D action platformer, really more geared towards the action part. Basically, think Donkey Kong Country once you get into the stages. And the platforming levels are really vibrant and really diverse in design, which really keeps the gameplay fun. Because overall, what all this disguises is a basic concept of a collectathon. Basically, when you go through the levels, you're going to be collecting hidden coins and you're also going to be collecting basic quills. Now, both forms of currency have different functions in the game. The hidden coins are really going to be what helps you progress through the overworld map, giving you access to new sections by basically paying this greedy sneak is snake character that has access to the gates that basically divide each section of the overworld map. And then you have the quills, which are more of like a currency for either buying upgrades or at the same time unlocking special objects or keys that will actually unlock most often different versions of the stages you've already played, giving you access once again to more secret coins. Now, I know what you're thinking. 
A collectathon in 2019 must sound like a really irrelevant concept, but trust me, the way they've integrated it into this game seamlessly throughout the levels really does not feel tedious or like a chore in any way. The game overall just ends up being fun. So on top of all this gameplay already, as I mentioned earlier, there's also sort of environmental secrets to unlock in the overworld. Basically, they give you access to an alternate version of almost every stage on the map. For example, you have a empty versus a flooded sewer system that basically you activate by diverting a river to flow to where that stage is located. Another one is basically unlocking a fan that gives you access to a blower over another one of the stages that activates the windmills in those stages. It keeps the gameplay really refreshing and honestly it's a really novel concept that is actually fun to unlock these alternate versions. And if you're aiming at completing the game completely and having the whole battalion, you're going to have to unlock and play through each one of these alternate stages. Now, to top it all off, there are even a character upgrade system in the game. And you have certain aesthetic, totally unaffecting gameplay that are just fun and unique. And you have others that actually seriously affect gameplay, helping you progress through the stages. However, to make this concept even more interesting, what they've also integrated is a sort of penalty system regarding the quills you'll collect. So the stronger or more potent the upgrade you use for Yuka and Laylee, the less quills you'll end up getting to keep at the end of the stage. Sounds funny? Well, for example, in the what you see on the screen right now, this combination of upgrades gives you a quill factor of 0.3. So basically, at the end of the stage, I will only get to keep 30% of the quills I collected throughout the whole stage. Basically, it's a really fun concept, because in most games, once you unlock an upgrade that, is, that helps you throughout the stages, you just turn it on and you never turn it off. However, by giving you this sort of penalty, the game pushes you to try to complete the stages with the least upgrades possible, or else you'll have to sort of play them over and over again to have enough quills to unlock everything on the map. Meaning that that one OP upgrade that normally you would just turn on and leave on the whole game, well, you're actually going to be trying to look at turning it off as soon as possible to not penalize yourself too much on the number of quills you're going to be collecting. So, at this point, I think it's pretty clear that I like this game. However, that doesn't mean it's perfect. And there are a few things that we're gonna talk about that are sort of downsides to this game. The first one I would like to look at is the actual personality of Yuka and Laylee themselves. Basically, almost every character in this game has some sort of quirkiness, some sort of personality that's developed during the game, except for Yuka and Laylee, the main characters of the game. And honestly, I find it's really a missed opportunity by the developer of this game because had they developed these characters, that's what's going to keep you coming back for sequels. And honestly, in this game, you could have substituted the main characters for almost any other characters you can think of, and the overall game and appreciation of the gameplay would have remained the same, in my opinion. The second thing that I thought could have maybe been improved in the game would be the overall difficulty of the puzzles on the overworld uh, map. Because basically, the difficulty, I find, just remains static during the whole game. Basically, whether you're talking about the first puzzles you start solving or the last ones in the game, they don't really get any more difficult as the game progresses. Even being, like I said, fairly uncomplex, in my opinion. And I think I get why the developers did this. They wanted to really keep a steady pace to the game. However, at the same time, if I'm looking, if I'm reviewing this game and I'm giving my personal opinion, I would have rather a certain progression into the difficulty of these puzzles and eventually having a few of them that would feel more challenging. The last issue facing this game, in my opinion, will basically be the length of the game itself. Because if you want to work through the campaign and focus only on locking the bare minimum you need to finish the impossible lair, 
In my opinion, a lot of players will be clearly under the 10 hour mark of gameplay and you'll be able to unlock enough with a few tries on the impossible lair to actually finish it without having to go any more, any deeper in the game basically. And I'm sure that at one point there are going to be really freak gamers out there that are going to manage after only three or four hours and unlocking maybe a dozen battalion members to finish the impossible lair without even going any further in the game. However, at the same time, the game does have quite a bit of replay value and for someone that wants to collect the whole battalion or just basically experience everything the game has to deliver, it does. It will take you quite a bit more time than 10 hours, which does feel right for a game that is priced around $40 currently. So basically it will depend on how you expect to play this game, whether the length of the game will feel adequate or not. So overall, if you're a fan of 2D platformers like Donkey Kong Country, Mega Man, that focus on fresh and vibrant stage designs and basic old school 2D platforming mechanics rather than flashy concepts, well, this game is for you. And overall, there's enough originality in this game where it doesn't feel like a clone of any of those franchises I just mentioned. This game is its own thing. And overall, the positives strongly outweigh the negatives of this game, which is why I'm giving it an easy 8.5 out of 10. Now, as usual, I'll be leaving affiliate links down below in the description of the video. So if you think you're going to be picking up the game, please use one of those links. It'll give the channel a small kickback and help me get more content out to all of you. As usual, if you did like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It does help out the channel a lot. And as usual, I hope I'll see you in my next video.